I'd like to now welcome uh, Rick Sears, General Manager of Athena Lake Formation, Ian Moore, and I've probably missed one, so I apologize, and Martin Hulse, the CTO of Cloud and AI for Trellix. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, like was said, I'm a general manager for uh, a collection of Amazon Web Services. Uh, I lead the Athena EMR uh, Glue uh, data integration as well as the data zone teams. And so uh, one of the things that uh, we're, uh, we're here today to talk about and, and kind of part of why the conference is a data and AI conference is to really talk about what customers want to be able to do uh, with their data to really power the, the end goal experience of, of AI-driven applications. And so, uh, as, as you just heard from, from Eddie and Barry, uh, AI, generative AI, and AI in general uh, is transforming all types of industries. Um, you know, generative, generative AI has taken the world by storm, uh, be, you know, mainly through uh, consumer-facing experiences uh, like ChatGPT, and then, uh, as was talked about earlier, in the last six months, uh, customers building uh, consumer-facing applications using uh, services like uh, Bedrock uh, to be able to power these you know, amazing experiences built on top of the latest innovations in uh, AI technologies and, and uh, foundational models. And so, but while you know, there's been a lot of attention on consumer-facing apps, uh, really the, the kind of differentiated experience is transforming all types of the industry. Um, and it goes you know, all the way into how our developers uh, write their code, uh, how our, um, our customer support people uh, work with data and understand the data that can be available to them to, to help their customers. And so, you know, it's, it's really what we want to work with uh, customers to figure out is how do they uh, go through that uh, AI journey uh, starting, uh, and our customers are starting from all different uh, kind of stages in that journey, uh, but be able to get to uh, AWS uh, applications uh, running AI uh, in production, powered by AWS. And so you'll hear uh, throughout the conference uh, examples from other customers who have gone through that journey. And uh, what we want you to be able to take away from that is how you can apply those same patterns, those same ideas uh, to kind of accelerate your journey in building AI applications to uh, transform uh, your businesses. And so uh, AI has been around for a while. Uh, why has there been such an explosion of interest, new capabilities, uh, uh, most recently. And so, uh, and, and many of you have been building AI-driven uh, applications for, for a while. Uh, at Amazon, as was talked about earlier, uh, we've been powering uh, applications and experiences with AI through things like personalization, uh, product recommendations, Alexa, and also uh, helping our customers build AI-driven applications uh, with uh, technologies such as Amazon SageMaker. Um, but recently, AI has reached a tipping point. And that tipping point comes from a combination of a massive amount of uh, additional computing power combined with a massive amount of general purpose data. And so if you take those two things together, previously where an AI model might have been trained on a small subset of data for a very specific task, now that AI model can be trained on a massive amount of data, and that results in a single model being able to be general purpose and provide in, in kind of exposed capabilities that can apply to a much wider variety of tasks. And so what does that mean for customers? And so, uh, you know, I love the examples uh, given earlier, and, and uh, one of the, I guess, uh, most fun examples I've heard is about the Panini predictor uh, that uh, we've, we've talked about that, um, uh, that Eddie uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, allowing them to kind of take information about uh, customer habits and, and their buying habits and turn it into a prediction of when the next uh, customer is going to buy a, a panini on the flight. I think these are examples of, of awesome experiences you can, you can power using AI. Um, but there's also some that are a bit closer to home. So uh, when I was starting my, my journey in, in the software industry, um, I worked for a number of small startups that were doing uh, managed security services. And so we would have a, an appliance deployed in a, a company's data center collecting a massive amount of information from firewalls and intrusion prevention devices and, and all types of, of you know, components in their architecture that were helping them secure uh, their networks. And then that, that information would flow through the system, uh, and, um, but all, at all stages of flowing through the system, we had to figure out how to minimize the amount of data that was passed from one stage to another. 
And really the, the challenge there was data was not our friend. We, we couldn't really handle the massive amounts of data that was flowing from one stage to another. And then when it got to the SOC operator, who was the one making the decision about a security threat, we had to make sure that we had the, the, to the minimum amount of alerts or you would overwhelm that SOC operator with a bunch of noise and they wouldn't be able to, to make sense of, of the key security threats. And so you hear from, from uh, Martin in just a little bit about how AI has transformed that uh, experience and, and made it possible for us to transform uh, the ability for a SOC operator to pay attention to the most relevant threats by using all the data possible, but then using AI to actually process that data instead of throwing it at the, the SOC operator to have to re uh, reason about. And so the key thing here is the d data is the differentiator in AI. And really, the key thing is your data, your, the business-relevant data, the data about your customers, the data about the, the uh, network environment and all of the different uh, security alerts that are coming from a specific customer's environment. That's the key to powering uh, your uh, Gen AI and AI-driven innovations, is really making sure that you have connections to the, uh, all of the data possible, uh, feeding that into the model and making use of that data to, to gain insights uh, that, are, that help you have a differentiated experience for your customers. And so uh, there's a lot of challenges that our customers face in um, building out Gen AI applications. Um, some of those challenges, uh, you'll hear, you'll hear uh, more about how, how our customers have, have uh, met those challenges in things like being able to select the right model for the right job, uh, being able to customize those models and, and change behaviors of those models. But a lot of the challenges our customers talk about in, in kind of getting started and, and creating generative AI applications actually comes from data. It's the data foundation that in, in a lot of cases is the, is the tough, challenging starting point. And that's having uh, access to all different types of data, connecting to all different types of data sources. But also, once you've connected, you need to make sure that your uh, data remains secure. Because a lot of this data is going to have sensitive information, and it's powerful to have that information available to the model, but you also want to uh, handle that data in a secure and governed way. And so what does this look like when we actually feed all of this into a generative AI application? And so um, you have a wide variety of data sources you want to connect to. Uh, you can use services such, uh, such as uh, Amazon EMR, uh, Glue, and others to be able to uh, create a data pipeline to move data from a wide variety of data sources into a place like a, a, a data lake uh, built on uh, Amazon S3. And um, when you're doing that, your pipeline, uh, which can be a reusable, reusable component, checked in, source controlled, that can guarantee consistency in your pipelines, that can guarantee quality. And, and this minimizes the risk of the end goal application, which is your Gen AI application, having bias or uh, other types of challenges due to data quality issues. And so there's, but there's also capabilities that AWS provides to make it even easier to connect to your data. And so we've recently uh, introduced a number of uh, zero ETL capabilities across our services, which make it a single click to be able to, to move data from, say, Aurora into your Redshift data warehouse that can then be um, used as part of your Gen AI application. Also, connectors to data sources, such that your Gen AI application can actually just connect to one uh, service, such as Amazon Athena, uh, that allows you to then query data from all different types of data sources. And that could be SaaS data sources, that can be other data sources in AWS, NoSQL data sources, but it can also be data sources uh, on-prem on and in other clouds. And so the key thing there is use the capabilities that are available, but make data your friend. Make data the thing that uh, truly differentiates uh, your Gen AI applications. And so uh, in Amazon, uh, the main point there is understand the, uh, the set of services that we have available. We have a comprehensive set of services, um, and we're here to help. Uh, you figure out how to, how to use those services, how to make the best uh, use of them throughout the data journey. Uh, you'll hear patterns throughout the, uh, throughout the sessions around how other customers are kind of uh, using uh, these, these different services. And so if there's anything you come out of this, this conference with is an understanding of what's available to you and some of the things that you can get started with in, in applying uh, the set of services we have. The other thing is, is that we are working in AWS to better integrate these services. To, to enable capabilities like zero ETL, where it's a single click, it's easy to, to get started uh, connecting to all your uh, data sources to, to power your uh, Gen AI applications. And then also governance. Governance needs to be something that uh, is something that we are thinking about and working uh, hard to, 
to uh, plug in in all stages of the Gen AI journey, but you also need to think about how are you governing your application, not just the permissions on the data from the starting point, but the permissions on the prompts and the permissions on all aspects of how data, either from your users or that you're you know, pulling from data sources, how that's secured and how you, you, you manage that in a, in a responsible way uh, to make sure you protect your, your uh, uh, most valuable data that you have uh, to power your Gen AI applications. And so I'd like to uh, now turn it into a real world application or real world example. And so I'd like to invite uh, Martin up to talk about how, uh, how they're building uh, Gen AI into uh, security applications at, at Trellix. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. Well, thank you guys. I am so excited to be here. Uh, I've been doing sort of an evangelist role for a long time. I've been GM products and a lot of different things that I'll talk about. But uh, this moment right now for me feels like the moment about five years ago, six years ago, when I became the CTO for cloud. And I, back then, I had to get our, our folks internally as excited about things like serverless as possible. So at one of our corporate events, I dressed up in a cloud suit and I came out and I did a little song and dance and I'm like, come on guys, you gotta get excited about cloud. And I feel like right now, this is where we are with AI because there's so much stuff out there about, oh yeah, you should use AI, but so few people have an idea of what they could actually do with it. And so we're trying to get this message out. There are real things that you can do with it that actually matter, that really save people time. So I hope that that's what you get from this. Uh, so a little background about myself. Uh, I got my start in security by running the Security Operations Center and Incident Response Team uh, for the state of Wisconsin. I did that for about seven years. And within that time, I uh, personally responded to about 5,000 different investigations and did all of those. So the stuff that I'm gonna show you here, this is from a practitioner's viewpoint. Uh, I love tech, I've been you know, a complete nerd my entire life, but at all times, none of this stuff is about the tech for tech's sake. It's not, oh, I found something shiny, let's figure out how to apply it. It's what are we trying to get done here? How can we do that more effectively? How can we do it faster? And then see if there's tech that will help solve that problem. And this is a really important thing in security because you're working against bad guys the entire time. This isn't something that's you know, a, a natural phenomenon. This is an actual adversary. And so you have to look at it from that standpoint and say, okay, if tech helps out, great. And how's that gonna look? But you have an actual uh, customer that you're trying to protect. Uh, so at Trellix, uh, I've found a lot of people don't know about Trellix, which is kind of interesting to me given uh, the amount of marketing that we've done. And as I'll show you in a second, uh, the, the long uh, pedigree that we have. Uh, but our mission statement really is about transforming security operations, which is a fancy way to say, uh, protect you more, better, all across the things that you're trying to do. So we have a 37 year heritage at Trellix, which is a, a crazy thing to say uh, in the tech industry. It started all the way back in 1987 with the infamous uh, McAfee antivirus. And that's really where the, our, the fight against the bad guys started. Uh, throughout that, a bunch of corporate stuff going on, but there's some really important things in here. So uh, FireEye was founded. Um, FireEye looking at uh, advanced stuff against uh, bad guys, then with Mandiant coming into the picture, and then Trellix founding in 22. So there's a lot to unpack here. And I think the best way to look at it is what we've done with the machine learning, because that's why we're here today on the bottom. So as I'll kind of detail here early on, we invented the impossible travel analytic in 2014. And uh, that's not a, a reference to how hard it was to get here and how hard it's gonna be to get home. Um, not on Ryanair, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> that's not, not why it's hard. Um, but the impossible travel anal analytic was the first really successful machine learning that we had in security. And it was very simple. It said that if you get two logins that happen from two different geographic locations that you know, would take longer than a Ryanair to jet to get to between the two, then it would probably be that it wasn't the same person logging in. And that was actually a really foundational piece of a lot of what we did, uh, very successful, but we'll kind of walk through uh, the pros and cons of that approach here. Uh, in 2016, we launched something called Guided Investigations. These were the same people that were writing the security content were actually writing the investigations that go with the content that they just wrote. So if something happens, here's what to do next. And we didn't know it at the time, but this was gonna become completely foundational to the things that we're doing in AI. Uh, then we found that you need to get some machine learning running on the endpoint itself. And uh, just last year, we launched our AI auto investigations. And this is really where the, the virtual analyst stuff starts to come in. 
so this is one of the first images that I think would make a great album cover uh, for my, my band. There's a couple on here that are really great. Uh, of course, all of the images are AI generated uh, because this is an AI conference and I can't draw. Uh, so this is, is helpful. Uh, but 10 years ago, um, so I forgot to mention that in uh, my role running a security operations center, I developed some open source software because we needed to analyze more things better. We had a small staff, we had to get a lot done. We were up against some really tough bad guys all the time. Uh, and so I wrote some stuff that eventually became uh, what today we call a Trellix Helix Connect uh, that, that licensed that through, through Mandiant and FireEye and on through Trellix. Uh, but since that whole time, uh, you know, over that 10 years, we were trying to solve security through big data. Uh, I talked about the impossible travel analytic. We did some, some good stuff there. Uh, but the, the initial thought was, well, the antivirus approach and the rules-based approach says if it matches something known bad, then we're going to flag it. Okay, that's important, but so many times there's something we haven't seen before. The, the, the really good bad guys figured out how to get around all that. So we set out to say, okay, we're going to create uh, machine learning algorithms that are going to figure out when something is happening that shouldn't be happening. And that was a, a good idea, and it, it worked in a lot of ways. Uh, so this was our initial approach, and for the most part, uh, still relevant to our, our current approach. Uh, the first part is uh, the executing on the mundane, as you just heard, which is taking and parsing log data. Uh, who here has parsed logs? <laughs> I think I have personally written probably uh, three or 4,000 different parsers um, over the years before we had some more interesting ways to do it. Uh, it is hard work, it's boring work, but it's so important to do if you're actually trying to solve problems. And so those are some of the details that go into the foundational part of AI as we get into the, the full story, seeing just how important it is to have those pieces that the AI can use later. So that's when we talk about this 10-year history. It's all the stuff that we did is now starting to be even more valuable. And so when we talk about the machine learning, that's really what we're saying is that we put in all this work and suddenly we're able to 10x the value on it because we're able to automate so much of that. So our approach was to get all this information, and you could think of it as a data lake. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, S3 and open search for the most part. Uh, then we would analyze all of the uh, data for anomalies, so the impossible travel, as I mentioned in there. And then that'll spit out an anomaly, and that goes to the human. And then the, the human goes through open search to investigate it. So pretty straightforward. Uh, works really well. If you have something coming through, then you can figure out very quickly what, what uh, is good and bad about the situation. So what worked, we got really, really good at ingesting massive amounts of data. Uh, I don't know if it's still true, but for a long time we had the largest Elasticsearch cluster running on Amazon. Uh, we're talking trillions of events. Uh, most of our customers have billions of events coming through every day. So when we talk about big data, we are to, this is how I know we were really big. Uh, we would go and search for things on forum posts and try to figure out what was wrong with our current you know, problem in engineering. And people are like, oh, we don't have any kind of data like that size. Uh, we got to the point where we realized the, the vendors that we were working with didn't have any customers as big as we were. And we had to really pioneer the big data part on our own in a lot of these situations. So we got really good at the big data part. We got really good at the analyzing and matching. How do you take known bad things like rules, I would call them an Intel hits or intelligence as in bad IP addresses, domain names, things like that, and then match that against these trillions of events that we have coming through. Uh, I'm going to use the term here, uh, obscene, uh, because sometimes it, uh, it really doesn't seem fair to have that amount of data. Uh, and to, then to be able to search that, and to be able to search it in seconds. We're talking half second, you know, maybe two seconds across that amount of data uh, worked really, really well. Um, what didn't work was beyond some of the, the winners that we had with like impossible travel, uh, we found that we weren't, our customers weren't using the analytics nearly as much as we thought that they would. So again, yeah, I showed you that picture of the, looking out into the distance over 10 years, we're going to solve security with big data. We thought that the analytics would be the big draw, and it turned out that the searching actually was the big part of it. People were having to manually go through and do a lot more of that than we thought. And so we, we sat down and we said, well, how can we make these analytics more valuable? So some of the specifics that we have on here, just to kind of give you a level set, 
because uh, these may be very relevant for you, uh, things like uh, weird usage of AMIs, so AMIs that have never before been seen, uh, API keys that are spun up, key pairs that were generated uh, abnormally. Uh, all this kind of gets uh, plotted and correlated so you can get a little bit better idea uh, across the, 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 you know, the entire enterprise what that looks like. And then on the console apps, uh, the directory logins, and as you can see, there's kind of going from the machine level all the way into uh, sort of the human level with things like Office Suites, uh, directory and infrastructure commands. So it was a service account just created. Um, that's, that can be very abnormal. So those are the kinds of analytics that we've been looking at that we thought were gonna be you know, the, the thing that customers were logging into and looking at the most. And we found that while these were valuable, they weren't necessarily looking at that at the, at the beginning. Uh, so why did we start with those analytics I showed you? Well, we did some study of root causes, security incidents. We said, well, how could we have detected this or how could we have detected something close to this? Because again, we didn't want to just have that exact match. Uh, and then we figure out what analytic would have caught it. Um, unfortunately, uh, this wasn't always helpful. <laughs> they were always correct, um, but they were not always helpful. So if someone is saying, uh, you are drowning, that is correct, they are drowning, but that is not particularly helpful to point out that they're drowning. And so we, weren't, we were getting really good at pointing out weird things, and so the, the analytics weren't wrong, they just weren't that helpful. And that's really what we're trying to get past and what we have really stumbled on with gen generative AI being helpful. It's how do we make that weird useful? Because detecting anomalies themselves was not enough. It was a start. Uh, but we needed a way to get that bird's eye view, and this is the second one I think would make a great album cover, so please no one steal that. Uh, this is the, the idea that you're going to need to get a complete lay of the land like a bird would and say, okay, the alert is this little tree down here, but where is the tree? Is it next to a river? Is it on a hill? What are the other things? And so we needed to get that kind of uh, ability to look at the entire situational awareness around every single finding that came through. And this is where we got kind of stuck at the beginning because while we had these guided investigations that would run all that, a human had to do that every single time. And so really to figure this out, we needed Gen AI. All right, so if you think about the last one, uh, diagram that I showed you, it starts out the same way. Now we have a ton of different data sources, all that hard work, the parsers and all that stuff going into the data lake. We have the findings coming out of the analytics. Okay, cool. Now what we have are the investigative tips playing an automatic role. And this is where stuff really started to change. We have these questions about a given anomaly. What else happened? Who else was involved? Is this the first time it happened? Is it gonna happen again? Okay, so we had this available before, but a human would have to go to every single alert and click on that and say, run these questions and then read through every single response and think for themselves, okay, what does this mean? And we had to be honest that that wasn't happening enough. So with Bedrock, it's able to run these automatically on your behalf go to the data lake, find those answers, and then if and only if it thinks that it's important enough to look at, it'll bother a human about it. And so to be able to do this, to be able to make weird useful, you have to have these initial findings in the first place uh, to investigate. So if you don't have all that hard work of the, you know, the rules and the analytics and the intel hits, then none of this matters because you didn't have anything to look at in the first place. So it's not like you can take Gen AI and apply it to trillions of events. That's not how it works. You have to first whittle it down to something that Gen AI can work with. And so that's one of the, the big lessons here is you're not going to say, uh, I'm, analytics are great for the trillions of events, right? They're the, the big data scale stuff. Gen AI is more at the human level operating on the human uh, sized data questions. Uh, but to get any of that data out of the data lake, you have to have that sub-second search. You can get those questions and answers done. So, okay, good, we had that. That hard work is paying off. And we had to have these pre-built investigations. So every single time that we wrote the rule, we had all the investigations that went through. And just because at the time, not many people were using it, we found out that actually pays off big time when you have uh, uh, Gen AI doing it for you. So here's where we had to be honest and say, if you are running a SOC like I did, you're not saying find me every alert that matters because you don't have time in the day to look at every single alert. So really what you're saying is find me the top 10 most important things because that's honestly all the time your staff are gonna have or maybe 10 you know, investigations per day, something like that. Well, you got a billion events. So how are you gonna get from a billion down to 10? This is really how this looks. So you have a billion events, Analytics uh, through uh, SageMaker and EMR will whittle that down to a thousand weird things out of that billion that came in that day. 
And that's where you see a big difference between 1,000 anomalies and 10 alerts because you don't have staff time to look at 1,000 anomalies. And that's where the bedrock layer is so important. It comes in and says, okay, these were not a billion. Bedrock operates on the 1,000 level, right? And it's gonna take those 1,000 and get that down to 10 things that you actually need to look at. So specifically, like an anomalous console logon, for example. All right, so the analytical thesis, we thought, all right, based on these recent investigations, uh, the telltale sign that an account is compromised is the password reset followed by a login from a new country, as in uh, they were able to reset someone's password and then log in over here. Okay, we know that's what that looks like. We're gonna use analytics to flag when that occurs. That's the anomaly. Uh, so the, if the password reset occurs uh, and lo someone logs in some, from somewhere atypical or weird, uh, this needs to be investigated. So that's, that was the initial analytical thesis. In the real world, um, and I, I love that image too, maybe not an album cover, but pretty cool with the, the poor little guy forgetting his password there. Uh, users travel, they forget passwords, they have executive assistants that have their password, and this happens hundreds of times a day in large organizations. So weird's not that weird is essentially what happens, but you still might wanna know about it. So what would it actually take to investigate that weird scenario to know, okay, is this something truly bad or was it just another one of those standard weird things, which is kind of a, an oxymoron there. Uh, so here's the steps that I just go through. First of all, is this user currently traveling? I'm gonna spend three minutes in human time to try to figure this out, that's step one. Okay, where were there failed attempts before that? Okay, it takes another minute. Does the user have an executive assistant, yes or no? Okay, that's another minute to look that up. What type of, what level of access do they have? Are they a VIP? Do they have comptroller level access? Okay, that took three minutes to figure out. And what did they do after the password reset occurred? That's a harder one, that takes something more like five minutes. So this is for one, Anomaly. We're talking about the thousand anomalies, and we're talking 13 minutes to look at one of those. Gen AI can do this itself in about 45 seconds with the help of the data lake that we build out. Uh, so this is already starting to uh, shape up very well. But here's the moment when I started to look at this output that I realized that we were never going back. This is kind of that new paradigm shift, if you'll forgive the, the aged term. Uh, but when things really started to show that this was an, a new era that we were in, and I'm, I'm coming at it from the security perspective, but think about this from whatever business that you're in, the level of information you can get out. This is uh, actual output from Bedrock, given the sort of bird's eye view that I talked about with all those different things, connecting all those dots. We took all that information, all the questions and answers, and we give it to Bedrock and we say, what do you think? Should someone look at this, yes or no? and here is actual output. I copied and pasted directly from one of our instances, and uh, with the 10 dot, I was able to put it in there directly. It says, based on the information provided, there's several signs of suspicious activity from this IP that weren't raising the alert level. So it made a decision, and now it's gonna tell you why it made that decision. So the SIM alert indicates a detected brute force attack correlated with successful logins. We didn't tell it that. We gave it information that we pulled out that contained that, it drew that conclusion on its own. And the biggest one here, and this is where my mind was blown when I first started to see this, it says this alone is a serious security event. As in, it, we didn't have to train this. This was pre-trained because it knows the entire internet. It knows all the MITRE attack frameworks. It already knows everything about security and fundamental security concepts like brute force password attempts. And so when you have the right information to give it, it will get the right conclusions coming out of it. And so it knew out of its own accord that that one piece meant that someone should take a look at this. But it went on and had even more supporting information. Uh, the IP has triggered other rules recently. Uh, it's able to figure out uh, the vendor names from everything coming through. So it knew it was Trellux IPS rules, uh, indicating there's ongoing malicious activity. Uh, it knew about the other things, generate logs from other stuff, firewall, DNS, Windows, showing broad suspicious activity. So this is the kind of thing that a human does. They're trying to figure out the scope of an incident. Gen AI is able to figure this out and tell you that it figured it out. And this is a huge part. If you don't have this kind of write-up, then you're not gonna be able to trust this. And so where we're going over time with this is to get more and more automated on the response end to the point where you can say, do you think this is a business critical asset? Yes or no. Do you think that this is the right uh, way to go with the remediations? Yes or no. But what we found is that most customers won't turn on anything that might impact business unless they're really, really sure, right? It's simple risk management. You don't wanna accidentally break something uh, 10 times a day just because you wanna be super safe about it. That's usually not conducive to business. 
But if you have this level of output that it's telling you and saying, here's how I was thinking about this, it builds that trust. So as you start to work with these kinds of things, you know how it's going to respond because you're used to it. And so that gives you that opportunity to actually turn things on that might prevent stuff from getting worse. Uh, this is a really, really big deal for ransomware. Uh, so you guys probably all heard about that. It's one of the worst things that can happen to a business. Uh, if ransomware gets in there, it can completely put them out of business if they're not willing to pay, even if they are willing to pay. Um, fun side note, the ransomware operators have some of the best customer service out there because they really want that Bitcoin uh, to unlock that data, which is pretty funny. But even they have outages, and so there, there are people that uh, get ransomed and they can't even pay even if they wanted to. Uh, but this is starting to impact uh, so many different places. I got email notifications from my bank, my hospital, and the university I went to basically on the same day. Uh, so this is getting really bad, and these are the kinds of tools you have to fight against. But even if you have great detection, if you don't have automated actions happening on there, the ransomware is still going to win. Um, they, they probably will get through uh, based on a phishing or some other credential, and they'll still get their job done. You have to be able to move uh, quickly and disable stuff. And the only way you're going to turn on anything that would be uh, able to do that and confidently do that is if you can understand how the system is working. So that's why having this output here from Bedrock that shows exactly its full thought process is how you actually start to win this. So now think about that if it's not in the security context. You're saying, well, that's cool, great for you, cool, your security products are going great. Uh, that's not my business line. Think about what this means for automation in the work that you do to have that kind of output and be able to see on a regular basis what the decisions it's making are. That means you can start to automate a lot of things with a lot more confidence. So in our perspective, we were able to take the 90% of stuff that nobody was looking at and actually bubble that up to be those, show me the top 10 things. And this is a little bit you know, funny math in that it's just kind of random stuff. Uh, five people, fine. If they work eight hours a day, that's 40 hours, uh, which means if they were looking at 10% of the alerts, uh, that's another 360 hours a day that basically was unstaffed. You didn't have time to look through all of those alerts. Um, does anybody remember the solar winds uh, incidents that happened a few years ago? Uh, we got a front row seat to that one. Um, this was something we were public about. We, f we were the only company in the world that found it. Uh, many other companies had the problem and didn't detect that they had the problem. And we found it because we had an incredible security operations center. And they went into that bottom part of the pyramid, the 90% that people don't normally look at. And so of all the security operations centers out there, we were the only ones that did it. We found it. Uh, that's great. How do we make sure that everybody has that level of security? Well, you have to go into that bottom 90%. Because when we found SolarWinds, it was on some low-level alerts about a service account being created after a certain other thing and one other thing happened. They were not critical events. No one was ever going to look, on them, look at those on purpose. We only found them because we had a very experienced staff that knew uh, some certain threat hunting skills that they did. And so we're trying to codify that part of it. Now, but the point is, that's the level you have to operate at if you're going to stop things like ransomware from coming through. So how do you actually bubble those up to the surface? You're going to need a ton of staff that don't exist. And so that's where this comes in. That whole investigative stuff that I was talking about with Bedrock, those are the staff that were, you were never going to hire because you were never going to 10x the total amount of security that you had. You can't afford to do that. But you don't have to. You just have to make sure that the staff you do have are looking at the right 10 alerts, not just any 10 alerts. So in another uh, scenario here, let's say an average customer gets 1,100 alerts. That could be analytic findings, matches, whatever. And it, there's 65 different little logs attached to that alert, we call them events. And it takes five seconds to look at that. So that's 357,500 seconds of analyst time per day, which is about 12 eight-hour shifts. So even in those kind of modest numbers, that's the total amount of human time that it would take to actually make sure that there was no bad things hiding in that bottom 90% of stuff that was never looked at. And so here's the before and the after. So we had to go from data mining to alert mining. Before, you have every single alert is like you're pulling on a boulder. It's really, really hard work, and so you can only do a few of them at a time you're going to need a robot army to figure this out. You have to have more help. So before, the analysts were totally overwhelmed with alerts. They're going to just do the best they can with the, the time that they've got. Now they can focus on that correct 1% at the top, the actual top 10 alerts that should be looked at, just not the ones that they know to look at. Uh, before, they were wasting time tuning tools to reduce the total amount of alerts. So it's a lot of clicking through their security tools to say, I don't want too many alerts. 
And now we have an interesting situation where you actually want more alerts because now you have the robots to do all the investigation. So that's what I mean by alert mining. It completely turns things on their head. Instead of tuning every last thing to make sure it's as perfect as possible, you say, open the floodgates, let it all through. The robots will take care of all the intermediate stuff and then you focus on the actual human investigation at the end. Now before, uh, the, you'd only focus on your favorites. Those are the alerts that were marked critical and that you, you know, trusted that were always bad. Uh, and now you can do these deep investigations on the most valuable ones. Uh, before, you had to try to re uh, reduce your alert aperture and it's basically tuning. And now you can spend that time on innovation and threat hunting. So by innovation, okay, that's kind of a, a funky term to use here. That can be actually reaching out to someone to say, you know what, it'd be great if we had this data source. Maybe you have an internal web app, a custom app that you've built. Maybe it's a mobile app. If you had that telemetry coming into your security system, you'd be in a lot better shape. But you know, that's something you meant to do. You meant to call that person and set up that meeting, but you didn't have time because you were looking at all these alerts. Now you can let the robots do more of the robot work and the humans do more of the human work, which is getting that meeting to make sure you have the right stuff coming into your security system. Um, and then b before you had, it, you were ignoring most of the alerts that were coming through and now making sure you can get that bottom 90%, uh, you don't have any alerts that are ignored. So why do you have to get better at all this? I've been talking about ransomware and that kind of stuff. Here's kind of the, the long-term view of what's been happening. Um, so in the 2005, and don't, these aren't like hard numbers, but in these eras, if you want to think of it that way, we had polymorphic malware. That's malware that was, each, each uh, specimen was different because it was modified slightly as it came out. So we had to build in machine learning into all the antivirus to be able to account for the fact that the files themselves were changing every time. Then in the 2010 era, we started to see a lot more with automated phishing. That's when phishing got really big. So we'd have machine learning uh, and email security. Uh, I led the team that did that for a number of years and learned a ton about scaling out uh, machine learning for that and just how many hoops you have to jump through to get around what the bad guys are doing there. So that was the cat and mouse game we were playing then. Um, then in 2015, you started to see a lot more credentials leaked out on uh, dark web forums. And so we had to get a lot better at event security. And that's really why we started down that data analytics path because we started to see so many credentials that were compromised uh, out there. And then just last year, uh, we have the generative AI for investigations because we saw more generative AI phishing. And I'll tell you, the gen AI stuff from an arms race perspective, it's not the, the better phishing emails that worry me. It's the fact that any attacker that gets in an environment is immediately an expert in whatever environment they're in. So if they get onto a mainframe and they've never coded in Fortran before, they don't need to know how to code in Fortran. They don't have to go to their dark web forum and contract that out and say, hey, I need a piece of malware for a mainframe and I'll pay you whatever in Bitcoin to do it. They can just go to Gen AI and say, create a Fortran thing that does this, this, and this, and then drop it in. So bad guys that land in an environment are gonna be much more dangerous than the bad guys of last year that land in an environment. And that's why you have to be able to get all 100% of those alerts evaluated. Uh, that's, that's really where we're at today and that's gonna keep going up. So you see that geometric curve there. Um, you've gotta keep pace and that's what we're, we're building out. All right, so uh, if you wanna see more, um, feel free to go to trellix.com. We're on the AWS Marketplace as well. Uh, I've got a bunch of uh, webinars along with my colleagues out on YouTube. So you can search Trellix and AI, uh, a number of other search terms out there. They'll, they'll jump out at you. And there's my personal LinkedIn. If you have any questions on that, I'm happy to take them. Um, I've got no problem. So uh, please reach out and uh, let me know if you have any questions.